friends and newcomers to the South Orange Library Discussion Group. Although we changed it to lecture series, it sounds <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. We have a very special guest, not the former South Orange Village President, because um, I received an email from Alex and a few days ago. He's in Central America. <laughs> So he didn't think it was worth coming back here to go back to Central America. What can I tell you? But I wasn't scared. I, I, you know, for 30 years, we've had people cancel out at the last minute. And for some reason, the good people who I know, they always come through. And one of the best people I know throughout the years is Bill Calabrese. Now, he's also the former South Orange Village president. And when he was here, You'll tell the years, but for all through the years, I think he really did so much for the South Orange and South Orange residents. He owned the, uh, the, the pharmacy nearby, and I know for a fact how many people would come over to me and say, Phyllis, I picked up my medicine, and I went over to Bill and I complained. The light changes too fast on South Orange Avenue, but don't worry, Bill said he's going to look into it. And I swear, they always have a change the feeling that you cared for them, and you did, and you and um, you were remarkable throughout all the years, and you have spoken here many years ago, but um, like I say, yesterday I called him up, and without a moment of hesitation, he said, of course I'll come, Phyllis. So, we, this is a former, former Village <laughs> 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 Village president, and um, I appreciate you, Bill, for all that you have done for South Orange and for me all the time. Thank you. Before I begin, I always thank all of my fellow friends and librarians for all of their help and support for these programs. I couldn't do it without them. And I really want to say, I especially thank you, Bill, for all the help and, and the things that you did throughout the years when you were at the head of the Philly president. So please now, let's give a very warm welcome to our friend. Thank you, Phyllis. You got a wonderful woman here. <laughs> really a wonderful woman. Uh, really, let me give you a little history of myself, because I, I think there's some people that might not know who I am. Uh, I came to South Orange in 1975, which was probably the second luckiest day of my life when I opened up a pharmacy in South Orange. The first luckiest day was when I married my wife in 1973. She gave up being a nurse because I had a dream of opening up a pharmacy on my own. So here we were, two 25-year-olds. Well, she was younger than me, but she won't admit it. Uh, she was about 23, 24, and she gave up being a nurse because she knew my dream was to own my own pharmacy. And we came to South Orange to settle and to, to seek our fortune. And thank you to the people of South Orange, all this occurred. And as this was occurring, and I became a member of the community, and believe me, this is a beloved community, I have never met people who were were so warm as the people that lived in South Orange. I used to joke that I could go to any street in South Orange and have a meal, just knocking on the door, <laughs> because I knew everybody and everybody was considerate and helpful. So as things progressed, uh, in the 80s, someone asked me if I would like to run for office. <coughs> and, and that was, I think, 1987. And, and what was transpiring in South Orange at that time was we just finished building the building here on Bose Avenue, uh, the senior building on Bose Avenue. And it was very controversial to build that building. Now we were going to build the one at 219. And there was a tremendous opposition to that building at 219 because people were afraid the wrong element was going to move into South Orange. And the B'nai B'rith was very dedicated to get that building built. And there was a major election. And in that election, I was asked to run for a trustee on a ticket run that was uh, headed by a man by the name of Bert Spiota. And Bert Spiota wanted that building built. And they ran an opposition ticket so that building would never get built. I'm just going to give you the history of South Orange to show you what a wonderful community this is. And the only way that that building would get built is if one person from Mr. Spiota's ticket was elected. All you needed was one out of four, and that building would get built because it was ready for three votes, and they needed the fourth vote. So I ran with Mr. Spiota. As time developed and the election went well. The whole Ms. Bert Spiota ticket lost, except for myself. <laughs> because the people of South Orange knew that he only needed one. 
and they picked me out, and actually I was the highest vote getter in, in the whole election, and that building got built. And today, that's a credit to the people of South Orange, that building, that, that building at 219. Imagine what South Orange would be without that building at 219 and all the wonderful people that have gone through those doors and lived and contributed to this community. Now I'm going to give you a little bit more about the history of South Orange. In 1987, I was elected trustee. In 1991, I was elected village president. But during the period between 87 and 91, the gentleman that was ran on the opposition party, he had a stroke. So they made me the acting village president. So for four years I ran the village, but I didn't have the title. But So a lot of times people say to me, how long were you the village president? I say 20 years. Because I, already, I got elected in 87, and by the time I left office was 2007. So I say 20 years. And it was always to, to like I said, the, the people of South Orange who kept me there and gave me all the faith in the world to continue on the progress that I wanted to do. Now I'm going to show you a photo. And I was showing somebody before. This was the front page of the New York Times in 1994. And that's me in my pharmacy outfit. Can you see? Can you see it? Can you see it? That's Sloan Street. There wasn't one store, nothing was on Sloan Street. It looked like a, a bombed out city from the Second World War. If you went to South Orange, you had to watch, look over your shoulder, make sure you weren't going to get mugged. They were stealing 1,300 cars a year out of South Orange. You remember that? Right. I'm just going to show you real fast. And, and what, what was happening here... You haven't changed at all. Oh, yeah. Well, what was happening in this article is the, art, the guy who wrote the, this article for the New York Times was saying that I was crazy. Because he said, you can't rebuild a community once it becomes a community of flight. So once people decide they don't want to live in, in the town anymore, they never come back. Right? I never got a retraction for this. I always had with my retraction from the people in the New York Times. But I want to give you a, a whole idea of what transpired here. In 1991, I was elected village president. 1993, an opposition party got elected for trustees in town. But the gentleman who got elected at that time as a trustee, his name was Chris Hardwick, had wonderful ideas about what to do with this town. And me, being a pharmacist and always, you know, trying to be compassionate and listening to people's troubles and trying to see what I could do to help them, I realized he had a great idea. That this town needed a complete makeover and it had to change its attitude. Because the attitude was an attitude of flight. People did not want to live in South Orange. If I went to a party or at somebody's house in the evenings between this particular period of time, people would say to me, why are you living in South Orange? Nobody wants to live in South Orange. So I looked at them, I would say, well, the day will come when you're going to be thankful that you live in South Orange. And you're going to be proud to say you live in South Orange. So this whole project got started with one little idea. idea here. We were having... Uh, Thanksgiving dinner, and I was talking to my brother, who was a playwright in New York City. And I said, what do we do to bring up the morale of South Orange? People are depressed. They're, everybody's always telling them it's a terrible place to live. Why are you in South Orange? You could be, you live in any place else. My brother says, you need something that's a real motivator. Why don't you do something different? How about a credit card? Now, a lot of people in this room won't remember it, but South Orange was the first community in the United States to have its own credit card. We were so successful that after about seven years, the bank dropped us because we were making so much money on it, and the people who were in South Orange were such good payers that they couldn't make any money. But we created an environment where people were proud to show their card every place they went, whether they were buying coffee or they're going on a trip to Europe. Everybody was using the South Orange credit card, and it built up the esteem of the community so much that no matter what I said after that, because we were in every newspaper, the Newsweek, Time Magazine, always South Orange, South Orange, South Orange. You turn on TV, South Orange, South Orange. Because there was such, in their mind, an innovative idea, which to me was very simple, but it, it created an environment where everybody was proud to say that they were part of this community. Do you remember that? I remember it all. Right, right. Simple concept. And then from then on, we moved in the direction of rebuilding South Orange. And uh, I used to walk around with all these placards under my arms, and Phyllis will probably remember that very well. And I used to give lectures and, spe and, sp and spoke about where South Orange was going to go. Ultimately, where was it going to go?
But I had such great bones in this community. We had the most wonderful community of volunteers that you could ever imagine was in South Orange. <coughs> We had, uh, we, right now we don't have any more, but we had a Village of Glow program. Around the holidays, we used to light the candles all around the duck pond. And it was a welcoming to people of all religions to please come to the duck pond. You know, we're celebrating every religion. And it was wonderful. And, and we used to have, and we started the Holocaust celebration, where the people from the former inmates, etc., would come here. We still have that. And we used to march to the churches and to the synagogues. Every year was a different one. To, to remember, so people would never forget what transpired during the Holocaust. In fact, I'll tell you a cute story. My mother died in, uh, in, the, in the early 90s. And I never gave a eulogy for my mother, because I knew my father couldn't take it, you know, if I gave her a eulogy. So I saved it. And I gave my mother the eulogy at one of the Holocaust celebrations. Because my mother was a freedom fighter in the French underground during the Second World War, and one of her jobs was to help Jewish people get out of France that they were looking. Because she used to tell me all these stories, how the trucks used to come, and they'd go to the movies, and half the people would be missing, and because they'd be all on the trucks, and used to hide the, the people in the walls. And So I knew all these stories ever since I was a little kid. My mother used to wash my feet in the sink, you know, and all that stuff. So at the Holocaust celebration, I gave my mother's eulogy, and I talked about a lot of these things. And as we left the, the, the area where we congregated and I gave my speech, we had to walk to a synagogue. And in the, in the procession, there was at least 30 or 40 survivors from the Holocaust. And one of the survivors walked up to my wife, and she said to my wife, she said, she's been to hundreds of, of memorials for the Holocaust. She said, never in her life has she ever heard anybody give a talk that was so personal. Only because that's how, you, that's how the characters are developed. You have to listen to people. You have to learn. I learned from my mother the atrocities that occurred there. So when I gave that eulogy for my mother, it was like everybody in that audience could relate to it because they remember it. My mother never even called the Nazis Germans or Nazis. She used to call them the Boots. And, and the people that were there, actually, that's what they used. They used names like the Boots because all you can hear was the clamoring of the Boots. But I don't, that was a little diversion. But these are all the little things that made South Orange a great community to redevelop. We had such a wonderful, warm environment of people. And, and like I said, as we started to develop the process, the people were willing to do almost anything to make it work. How would you like it if you were still here, and I said to you, well, I'm going to dig up all South Orange Avenue, I'm going to narrow it. There was nobody complained. I was digging up the whole street. You couldn't get up and down South Orange Avenue because we were widening all the sidewalks and we were and, and narrowing the thoroughfare. There was a time you couldn't cross from one side of the South Orange to the other side of South Orange unless you got in your car and drove. That's how fast the cars were coming down South Orange Avenue. So they used to come straight down the hill, right through the village, and, and trying to get home wherever they were going in Newark or if they're going to St. Barnabas, whatever. You couldn't cross the street. In fact, if I was showing you the picture what it looked like, even the picture I'm showing you here, if you go look at Sloan Street now, go look and see how close the sidewalks are to the other side so you can cross. There was a time, if I, in this picture, if you looked at it, you didn't even want to cross there, even though there was no cars, because it was just so wide, it was intimidating. So I had all South Orange Avenue dug up, and here we are, building <laughs> the sidewalks out, and doing all this, this work, and, and, and as, as you know, nobody complained. Bill's doing it, it's okay, we're going to get better. That's what we're doing this for. And, and uh, New Jersey Transit came to us, and... Uh, New Jersey Transit was having trouble. They had in the paper that they were going to do the, a Midtown Direct train. They were going to go from this whole western corridor straight to New York in about a half hour. And every town along the corridor they went to, they went to East Orange, Orange, South Orange, Maplewood, Milburn, all the way up to Summit. They asked them, they said, could you provide us parking? Because one day, all your communities are going to be thriving with commuters that are going to take trains back and forth to New York. But nobody understood this, except for South Orange. Because here I was in a rebuilding mode. I wanted to rebuild the whole town. So we called up New Jersey Transit, and I said to them, I'm giving you the parking. And, that, and we became a partner with New Jersey Transit. We were the first partner on the whole western corridor to work with New Jersey Transit to improve transportation back and forth to New York City. And that parking lot that's where the soul pack is, that's the lot that we developed. When we started, that was 
a, a lumber yard. It was called Siklai's Lumber Yard. And it was basically a, a lumber yard that didn't have much business because who was buying lumber in the 1980s, you know what I mean? So we walked, I walked right across the street with him. I left the drugstore. I went right across the street with New Jersey Transit. I said, Mr. Siklai, how would you like to sell your property? He said, I would love to sell my property. I said, here, you talk to the gentleman. His name was Mark Gordon, and they'll make a deal. And then one month, they made that deal, and they built that parking lot, that beautiful parking lot that we have next to SOPAC. And as part of that deal, New Jersey, New Jersey Transit said to me, what would you like for helping us to facilitate this particular uh, parking uh, area? I said, I, I want a piece of land because I have a, a dream of building a theater arts complex. So they said, well, how about we portion out this particular area? I said, well, how much do you want for it? He said to me, well, we'll give it to you for $50,000. Deal. So they built this whole parking lot, and they cut out this portion that you see SOPAC on. Because the idea was, ultimately, that was my dream. That was the centerpiece of the whole downtown of South Orange. That would be a reason why people, 30 or 40 years from now, would come to live in South Orange because they would have movies, theaters, and entertainment at night. It was my indoor park, as I used to tell people. I said, you put money into outdoor parks for young people? Let's build something that the middle-aged people and, and, and seniors can enjoy. And that's what ultimately happened. That, that's an interesting story. Too. You want me to tell you about the art center? Yes. I'll tell you about the art center. We were, we were in the process of building the art center, and I had a, um, a, a, a good friend and uh, nobody could understand why he was my friend, because he was, he was a very abrasive type of person. But he was so in love with South Orange, he would do anything to help South Orange. His name was David Presson, and I, I appreciate that David always worked with me. And, and, I, and David and I were basically trying to get this, this art center built, because he knew what I wanted. And we, and we uh, hired uh, the best uh, architect in the world, I'm trying to remember his name now, but. He came in and he developed this beautiful, beautiful theater. It was the number one theater on the East Coast. It would have been, you know, perfect. And my brother was the playwright, helped him along, and they developed this thing. And my wife passes away on a Thursday, and the following, and I buried her, and the following Monday they had a meeting because all the estimates came in and we were way over budget. So I'm sitting there at, at this table with all our representatives, and they were looking at me like, what are we going to do? Because it's over budget, you know, we, we can't build this thing. <clears throat> so I said to the, to, the, to the council and the people there, I said, well, I guess we have to start all over again. we got to start from scratch. And it took another two years, and ultimately, we built this building here in South Orange. And that's a real credit to this community. Have you ever been into that there? Yes. Oh, sure. And we built it. And it, like I said, that's the credit. That's the centerpiece of South Orange. You pick up any, anything that they're trying to sell a house in South Orange, they always show us out so back, right? Everybody, because that's the centerpiece of South Orange. And that's going to create the, old, the whole Western Corridor. When West South Orange, if you now you see they built this beautiful apartment house, and they're going to build some more apartments and all that. That's what's attracting the people who live in South Orange. Not only the train, but the idea that you can walk out your door, it's safe, it's secure, and you have everything in front of you. You'll have your, all your restaurants like you're, you always dreamed of, your theater, your movies. You, there's no reason to live anyplace else. When I sell my house, I'm going to live in a downtown too, because there's no place else to go. So the theater ultimately got built, now I got my centerpiece. But there was a lot more to do in South Orange, and now we had to figure out how to lower taxes. So that's why you start seeing a lot of these buildings popping up, because South Orange is one of the highest tax communities in the country. You know, it's awful hard <laughs> to, to live in South Orange because of the, of the, tri, uh, the tax structure. Am I right, Ms. Cohen? Very hard, very hard, especially as you get older and your income is decreasing. So the idea was to start building uh, very luxury condominiums in the downtown area, something that would attract people when they sell their houses, they wouldn't want to live, because now they have everything. They have uh, a community which we're creating as far as the external within narrow streets, wider sidewalks, outdoor dining, the, the theater. But how do we keep people enabled to afford to live in South Orange? So we started to build these condominiums, and there was a, a, basically a limit in my mind to how many South Orange could tolerate, because you didn't want to overbuild, because you don't want to lose the, the quaintness and, and, and what we consider really South Orange, the tree-lined streets and everything else. So we started to build these, these units, and then we, we built the one on Volsey Avenue. 
We put, now the one on South on Jamie is finally completed. We built the one on 3rd Street. So everything started to develop, and the town became safer. As I mentioned to you before, 1,300 cars a day were, uh, a year were being stolen. By the time I left office, 20. So we went from 1,300 to 20 cars. We closed down streets. We, if you go down South Orange Avenue, there's a number of streets that are closed down. Because what I did was I created pockets of parks. So if you lived in the Montrose area, I closed down all the accesses to these streets that border South Orange Avenue. So if you go in, you can only get out one area. So they all became like little Llewellyn parks, you know, to protect the residents. So well, this was all basically for crime. And Irvington Avenue, all those streets that border Seton Hall, all of them were closed down on one side too. So you can't get in and out to create crimes. You know, the whole idea is if it's harder to get out, you don't create it. You don't do something bad. That's, that was it. I grew up in North and East Orange. I learned my lessons. <laughs> I've seen what happened. But the, the whole point is all these things started to come together. But the, the truth of the matter is nothing would have happened if you didn't have a, a, a real good crux of the people that lived here. You know, South Orange is a community of all races, religions, and creeds. We've all been living here for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. There's never been any problems because the people are all loving to live in this community. So when I started to do all these things, like I said, nobody complained. They said, oh, we're going to save our community. They all work together to save this town. Uh, I, I just can't describe the, the wonderfulness of the people because no one ever said no. Oh, Bill's doing it? Do it. Am I right? Bill, just do it because they knew my heart was with them. You know, I was trying to save them. I was saving their properties. I was saving their standard of living. That was the whole point behind this. And, and they all came together at the same time. I always say that, and I used to give the speech sometimes, I think when I opened up SOPAC, I gave that speech, that I have to be living under a lucky star. Because all these people were in South Orange at the same time I was there. All these people like the Dave Bressons, and all these people that all you had to do was to say, can you do this? And they did it. And, and what they did was they created the American dream in this community. Like I said, you go, it's just in this room. You have everybody here. You have all nationalities, you have all religions, you have everything. Because South Orange has always been that community that has the ability to love one another. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a town when you walk down the street, people smile at you. You know, you don't walk by somebody and you go like this. You walk down, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? I still do that. I smile and say hello to everybody I see, whether I know them or not. Because that's the community that we all want in South Orange. Like I said, I can tell you stories forever. I could bore you to death. But it's the people. And when, when Phil said we talk about the community, it's a community of love. I really believe that. South Orange has such wonderful people that lived here. Uh, the, the Village of Glow all started because there was some religious strife back in the, in the 70s. What did they do? They created an environment where all religions came together on, on, a, on a holiday in December. Right? The Holocaust, all these things, South Orange was always at the forefront of everything because of the wonderful people that lived here. Uh, I, like I said, I could tell you a million stories. In fact, I'll tell you one more story. I had to go to Washington, D.C. They had um, uh, a convention, a, a transit convention, about how to rebuild cities <coughs> around mass transportation. So New Jersey Transit, since, I, since South Orange was, was their first partner, said, Bill, could you speak for us? I said, sure I could. But I didn't know what I was in for. I get down there, there's a thousand people in the audience. And they had two speakers, myself and the mayor of San Francisco. All right? Now I'm thinking, oh my God, this guy's going to embarrass the heck out of me. And he was talking about the subway system they were building in, in San Francisco, which is probably one of the most beautiful subway systems in, 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 the, in the world today, in San Francisco. And it was going to cost at that time a couple of billion dollars. And I'm talking about South Orange, I'm, I'm narrowing streets, I'm building a theater, you know. And I got to, and I talked, and when the question and answer came, nobody cared about the guy from San Francisco. A thousand people were raising their hands because they all were more interested in a community like South Orange and how they can do the same thing. In fact, one woman raised her hand from St. Louis, <clears throat> and she said to me, Mr. Calabrese, tell me more about your performing arts center. I looked around, I just I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, you mean the one in Newark? She goes, no, the one you're building in South Orange. 
So I said to her, good, I'm going to steal that. It's going to be called the South Orange Performing Arts Center. Just like that. So, but, I mean, the whole, the whole system for 20 years was like a dream. You could not believe all the things that <clears throat> fell into place simply because this was the community that I think that God wanted to make the example of what America should be like. And I, like I said, I gave that speech many times. And I'm very proud of the people in this audience. I'm very proud of all the things that South Orange did. And, and when the day comes and, and the good Lord takes me, I'll have a smile on my face because I know I contribute to make this country and this city a better place for all of us to live. Thank you. Any you got any questions? I just wanted to make a statement. Had I been here when you were running, I would have been your campaign manager. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to share one thing, and that is I had a knee replacement and I was on a walker and I'm walking to the village. And then I guess a couple of weeks later, I'm walking in the village and I'm on a cane. And a storekeeper came out and said to me, I'm so glad you're off your walker and you're on a cane now. <laughs> and, and I'm from New York City and I love New York, but Nobody would have done that. <laughs> so, you know, what you said about the people. Oh, like I said, <laughs> so it, 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 was, it was an unbelievable period of time. You, you know, you, like I said, you can never believe what actually transpired. If I said I was going to do it, oh, Bill's going to do it. I had, I had a real estate agent once, and they couldn't sell a house. And remember, you got to remember how bad this was. They couldn't sell a house in South Orange. No, nobody would buy a house in South Orange. So, I got the, the what do you call it, the St. Patrick's Day parade to alter their route. So from now on, the St. Patrick's Day parade ran through South Orange. So we started at uh, Sacred, remember that? Sacred Heart Church, and they would go all the way up South Orange here, and go through South Orange, and they go to Crying's Restaurant, where they would have their repast after the after the parade. So we, nobody could figure out how I ever did that. But I had all the parade going up South Orange. Yeah. So now this poor girl, and what I used to do is, they used to if somebody wanted to buy a house, the realtor used to tell them to call me up on the phone. And, and then ask Bill Calvary all the questions you want to ask about South Orange, because people were afraid to buy in South And I would say, oh yeah, I'm going to build this theater, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And I try to explain to people where the town was going. You know? So one day, this girl, uh, I'm trying to remember her name, but she was a realtor, she said to me, Bill, somebody's going to call you on the phone, Get, tell them everything that you're going to do in town. I said, okay. So the woman calls, I tell them everything I'm going to do in town, and now the parade is on Sunday. And I'm riding on the back of the fire engine, Waving to the crowd, and the fire is going up south on Jehu in the parade. And all of a sudden, the, the realtor runs in front of me, the young girl runs in front of me, she goes, Bill, they bought the house! They bought the house! <laughs> well, I want to say, that's the way it was. It was amazing what transpired. Uh, I remember as a teenager coming to South Orange and going to Grunnings right. for ice cream Sunday. Now, I don't live in this town, I live in Union. But could you? What about the restaurants here, if I wanted to? What do you have here? In oh, I, I tell you the truth, I go to Pacones all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where Grunnings used to be. Oh, yeah. go there for lunch. Just, what is oh. that? Where is that? Italian? Or? It's, it's Italian, Italian. Yeah. but you go there for lunch. You're not going to get a better meal. I, I take my daughter there like two or three times a week. It's $9. I'm, I'm, I'm diverting. It's $9, but he's a very nice man. Salad, homemade soup, main course, $9. How could you go wrong? And they signed up for our senior discount. And they signed up for your discount? And just their last with their wonderful. 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 I live in, the, in West Orange, but I always used to come down to South Orange. They had the shop right, which is Ashley's right. now. I used to do my shopping here. And they used to have art in the park. Right. And they used to yeah. have lessons here too. Right. I was more here than my own town. That's right. Well, see, that's why I said South Orange had all the bones. They had the right people in this town. It's just that they, they were stuck in a, a community of flight because they had the, uh, you know, I'm not going to get too deep into this, but they had the riots in Newark. They had the, the advent of the shopping malls. All this stuff contributed to drive, pe and the high taxes, to drive people out of South Orange. But the people that lived here were wonderful people. They really loved this community, and that's why they had art probably the number one art show in the, yes. in the country. I think, we, in fact, they might have even had the first art show, but I'm not positive, where all South Orange was closed down, where artists would come in from yeah. all over the world and sell, and sell their artwork here. We were the first community to do that. In the park. Well, no, the on South Orange the Avenue. The whole, the whole South Orange was closed down for the art show on a Sunday. And, and, you know, and like I said, I used, to buy, I used to buy artwork from a fellow from Peru. He used to come up only for the art show in South Orange, and he was a, a Peruvian artist. 
Well, when you had, when they had it in the park, I did buy two uh, ink uh, prints or paintings. It was a combination of uh, paint and ink of the um, Paris. Right. And I still have it. No, this, this town, had, like I said, this was a, a town way ahead of its time. It's just they got trapped in that particular yes. period of time, which drove people out. The thing was to get the people to come back, and they did. In fact, New Jer uh, South Orange right now has the largest ridership on the train to New York than any other community on the Western, on the Western Corridor. Because this is the place that people want to come to take that train to go to New York. And as you can see, in the morning, it's hustling and bustling. I mean, in fact, New Jersey Transit, we have, we have the only handicapped station on the whole corridor because of our partnership with New Jersey Transit. They put in the elevators, they did all the... You don't even realize that's not the same train station that was here in this picture. They raised the tracks, they did everything to make South Orange. They invested millions of dollars in this community, besides the parking. Getting back to the art show, I used to enter that show. Right, I remember they that. used to fence off the place of the whole thing, right. and yeah. they had very important people who were judges. Right, right. And they gave yeah. out prizes. Oh, I, yeah. believe me, I remember you. And this community, I don't, a lot of you have lived here most of your life, I would think, but this, this was uh, an area where you had the captains of industry that lived in South Orange. If you want to be a village president, most of, that's why the village president doesn't get paid in this community. Because these people, most of them were so wealthy, it was just more like a, a contribution to the community to run, to run the town. They didn't look for any money or anything, to, you know, to, or a reward. It, it was just the love of the town. And like I said, they were the, the biggest, Colgate, Palmolive, I could just start drawing names out there. But they all lived in South Orange. The Mushroom House belonged to the Bamberger's family. You know Mushroom House on South Virginia? Yeah, yeah. That was a Bamberger's house. I mean, uh, every, every, and a lot of the stuff you see now are not the original houses. There were big estates there. They went down, they built other big houses, but they built like four or five houses where there was one big estate. But this, is, this town was really, in fact, in the 1950s, South Orange had the highest per capita income of any town in the United States. So the average income in South Orange was higher than Hollywood, California, Beverly Hills, any place. There was more money in this town than any other town. But isn't Maplewood based on the same thing as South Orange? Well, South yeah, Ma Maplewood and South Orange were basically the same community at one time, and then they divided it off. In fact, um, South Orange and Maplewood have the same school system, like you know, and it's based on the fact that the <laughs> it sounds crazy to say this, but the people in South Orange were wealthier than the people in South Orange when they divided it off. So the tax base is based on the people in South Orange supporting more kids in Maplewood than they, than they pay for in South Orange. Because South Orange, like I said at the time, was so much wealthier than in most other communities that they put the extra burden on South Orange to pay for the education of some of the kids in, in Mayport. You know, it's, it's like I said, the history of South Orange is very, very interesting. Very interesting. And I'm glad that most of us in this room all contribute to some extent to, to what transpired over the last, let's say, 30 years, you know? So, after this, you know, big life of all the things that you did in South Orange, what do you do now? <laughs> well, like I said, see, my, wa my wife passed away about 15 years ago, and, 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 I, and I hung on, and I hung on for a while, you know, running the drugstore in the town. But then when I lost my final election, I said, this was a good time to get out, you know? So my kids were, se uh, well, she died, they were seven and eight. By the time they were about 13, I decided they were going to go to high school. I didn't want to lose them, you know what I mean? Because it's just too busy everything I was doing, so I decided I would stay home. So I became Mr. Mom. I oh, drive them to school, I pick them up from school, blah, 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 blah. you know, I do the cooking, I do the cleaning, and then now they're, they got out of college. My daughter is in graduate school, and my son has one more year to go. So I'm back into, into the high life, you know. I'm working in a drugstore again, and I, I really enjoy myself. But I like helping people. In fact, I'm working in a store in Clifton, and the guy that owns it can't believe it. He says, half the customers ask for you now. They don't even ask for me. <laughs> because I like talking to the people. I like to know about you, you know? How are you going to help somebody if you don't know about them, right? That's right. Right? You know, you, you got to know that they have children. You have to know what type of jobs they have. I used to be a nuisance. Nobody would walk in that drugstore without me knowing what they did for a living, you know? Because it's important, right? You know, they say, oh, I want my blood pressure pills. Oh, you can't have that one, I would say, because I know what you do for a living. That's not good, you know? Right? But uh, that's the way it was, you know? Everybody, everybody was a friend. I love that drugstore. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In fact, we still have, right, we still have reunions. In fact, you know, uh, the drugstore was, a, was one of the smallest drugstores in the United States that I had when I opened it up. You know, we had uh, 
700 square feet, something like that, my wife and I. And that wasn't very big. And do you know that for 30 years, I was in the top 100 pharmacists in the country, and the drugstore was in the top 100 pharmacies in the country, and you had like 700,000 drugstores. And every year, we were in the top 100 because of the way we ran, we ran the business. And my wife used to say to me every year, she says, yeah, they, uh, yeah, Bill, but it gets easier every year. There's less drugstores. <laughs> you know, the hardest one was the first year. After that, it got easier because there was less drugstores. But uh, like I said, I can never thank the people in this community for what they did for me. You know, and In fact, I'm, I'm both in the Hall of Fame of Mayors and the Hall of Fame of Pharmacists. So like I said, I had a very nice life, but it's not because of me. It's because of the people who have contributed to make my life what it was. You know? Thank you. Thank you.